up next. <laughs> and then we will write that. That's what our favicon will be for code with zooks. That the Z in code with zooks or Z if you're an American. So um, over, I want my background to be black. So I'm going to come over here and change the background to black and then there it is h reference favicon dot ico save that and then let's open the file and look at that there's our icon in the same way that Google has its own little icon over there. We also have our icon. HTML documents consist of the HTML element, otherwise known as the root element, which contains two sibling elements, namely the head and the body element. The head is not displayed in a browser, but rather contains information such as the page title, author, page description and references to external CSS files, etc. The body element on the other hand contains all the actual displayed elements including text, images, videos, links to other web pages, etc. In this lesson, we will learn about this general structure of HTML documents. Let's recap. An element consists of an opening tag and a closing tag with content contained between the two tags. Elements can have attributes which can be used to label the element or even change how the element looks and behaves when viewed on a browser. In this lesson, we will look at the general structure of an HTML document. Before we start, we need to take note of two important concepts about elements in an HTML document. The first concept is nested elements. It states that an element in an HTML document can have another element inside it, which is called a nested element or a child element. This element can in turn also have a nested element inside of it and so on. The second concept is sibling elements. It states that two or more elements can share the same parent element or can both be directly inside the same element, therefore making them sibling elements. So with those two concepts in mind, let's explore the general structure of an HTML document. The very first thing that all HTML documents should have is the doc type. In all the versions of HTML, such as HTML4, there would be a number of rules that the developer could choose to follow when writing the document. The doc type would then be used to tell the browser which rules it should use when interpreting the document. Different doc types would look something like this, which is very lengthy. Fortunately for us, HTML5 was like, nope, that is too messy, and simplified the doc type to the short form we now use in all new HTML documents. That's all you need to know really about doc types, just included at the beginning of every HTML document. Following immediately after the doc type is the HTML element, otherwise known as the root element. It's called the root element because all other elements are contained within it. Then inside the HTML element, there are two sibling elements, namely the head element and the body element. The head element is not actually displayed in the browser, but contains a bunch of information such as the page's title, the author of the page, the description about the page, links to external styles, etc. The body element, on the other hand, contains the actual content that is displayed, whether it be text, images, videos, link to other websites, etc. So now we're going to head over to our source code editor, play around with these so that we can get a better grasp of these practically. Let's go. All right, so let's see the general structure of an HTML document practically. Okay, so as we mentioned, whenever you're writing a HTML document, you start off with the doc type, which tells the browser that I'm dealing with a HTML5 document. And then next up, we start off with the HTML element, otherwise known as the root element, which will contain everything else in your document. So that is always the element that you will always find. Or as the main element or the element that encapsules 
or the root element, uh, everything else that will be found. Uh, let's just proceed and save this document I'm over here. Say general structure.html. I'll just change this to all and save. Now that's saved. All right. So then inside, before we actually proceed with what's inside, remember we spoke about attributes. It's a good idea to include an attribute known as lang or lang for language in, in the, in the uh, opening tag of the HTML element. Uh, here you specify the type of the language that is to be used in this document. Uh, in this case, we are dealing with uh, English. That's the language that's going to be used in the document. So uh, I'll leave in the description of this video the where you can find an exhaustive list of languages that can be used. For instance, if you are writing a, a website uh, that is going to be using Japanese as the main language, then you change that. I think the code for Japanese is JP or J. I'm, I'm not sure, actually. I won't lie. I'll leave the, as I said, a, a, a link to a web page that contains an exhaustive list of the different languages. So that's very important because this tells, for instance, uh, applications that are able to take the website, I mean, your web page, and then uh, pass it such that it can be read out, for instance, for people who do not see, uh, who rely on, on, on audio cues or audio in order for them to be able to consume web pages. So specifying this is very helpful because that then makes sure that words will be uh, pronounced correctly uh, so that, uh, yeah, so that people can be able to use it uh, eff effectively. So that's the first one, the HTML element. Inside the HTML element, there is the head element. Open here. And by the way, you will notice that whenever I create a new element, for the most part, my special elements that are going to contain other elements in them, I always open it, uh, leave a space between, and then I go tab. The reason for this is to make uh, your HTML code more readable. For instance, when I'm looking at this, I can immediately see that, okay, this is an HTML element. And since all the everything that's one tab as in th that's the level of it and then to the right a little bit to the right by one tab that then tells me that okay this is an element that is inside the html element my eye can quickly pick that up and then in like manner the second element is the body element as we mentioned Now notice that the head element is in the same level as the body element. This then tells me that these two are actually sibling elements, which be both belong to the HTML element. So that's a very, very important point. If you want your HTML uh, to be easily readable by other people, uh, or you want your, for, for even for yourself, when you later on come back to your HTML, element uh, so that it's easy for you to quickly understand or remember what's where, where are the elements. It's very important for you to use this indentation uh, method uh, so that it's easy to see where's the parent, where are the children's, <laughs> where are the children, uh, and where are the siblings. Okay, so the head element, as we said, is going to contain a bunch of stuff, things that are not actually going to be displayed on the on the body. In this tutorial, we're actually going to spend quite a bit of time in the head element. The reason for that is because, well, for most of our other tutorials, when we start now exploring web uh, creation, uh, as far as the content is concerned, we'll be spending that time in the body element. Uh, and uh, it goes without saying, or to mention again, the body element is where you actually specify things that are actually displayed, such as saying H1, which is the number one header, which your document should really only have one H1 element, or which is kind of like the main or the master header element. 
Uh, so we would say something like general structure of HTML documents. Yeah, and everything else that's going to be visible. So for instance, this H1 element will be visible. Now the header contains a bunch of things such as the title. You put the title of the document here, which will not be shown in the main area of the of the browser when it's showing. The title you can kind of like have the same thing as the um, H1 element. Not to confuse the two, this one is actually visible because it's in the body. The title is not visible. Let's explore a bit, by the way, what the title tag is actually used for. So if we save this and we go over here where it's saved that's where it's saved we open it ha so notice now you see that's the h1 element see on the browser when you look on the tab you notice what's written there that's what's actually contained on the title element so another use of the title element is that when you come over here and you want to bookmark a page you notice the name the name that is used is actually taken from that title tag, similar to what's written here. So it's very important for you to always include a title tag. If you don't include a title tag, then something like this will happen. Uh, it will actually display, let's see. See, it's now displaying the file name. And sometimes, uh, generally, you, you don't really want that. So it's always a good idea for you to actually specify the title tag. Uh, over there okay so that's the first one now next up there are tags which are known as meta tags meta tags are um, do not have a closing tag they are empty elements or empty tags or rather meta elements are empty elements uh, which means they do not have a closing tag so meta tags contain information about the page. This information can be used by the browser or even by other web platforms such as social media networks or search engines. For instance, one meta tag can be used to specify, let's see, if we add this attribute to this particular meta tag, say char set or character set, UTF minus eight, so this meta tag is going to tell the browser that the characters that can be used in this particular document are of this type, UTF-8, which basically says that it's all the characters uh, in all languages. So if you know that your particular page, it's a good idea to just include this particular uh, character set uh, meta tag when you want to allow your document or your web page to be able to support all characters uh, in all you know known languages. So we'll get back to meta tags in a little bit because we're going to do something a little bit fun that will help you to actually see why it's very important for you to specify uh, proper meta tags. So even though it's not the, it's not actual content that's going to be displayed on the browser when the user is, is is using it, but it has very important uses. We'll get to that in a bit. Other things that you can include in your header are links to style sheets. That is to say, for instance, when you, once you start using, okay, let's just close this off. Once you start using CSS to style your page, you would include style sheets, or this is one of the main places where you would include style sheets, or you would say that, okay, I have a file that contains styles. I'd like for you to include that file in this document. So you'd go rel uh, style sheet. This is specifying the relationship between this document and this other document that you're about to reference. In this case, you're saying that, okay, this link references an external document, which is a style sheet. And then you would go and use this other attribute to say href, which says, okay, where is the file located? If, for instance, let's say your file was located in a place like, let's say, a website code with zooks.co.za uh, style.css. So that would actually be the file name. And then that's the full 
URL to that particular file. So you're saying that, okay, I want this file to be used, the styles contained in this file to be used in this document. That's what that would mean. Or for that matter, if your file is local, that is to say this document, general structure, and the style file is in the same website or in the same folder specifically, you could be able to you could be able to even specify the style like that. But we'll spend more time uh, exploring the various ways in which you can reference external documents when we get to that. Uh, so that's the link that you can have. And of course, you can have more than one uh, link. Let's say you have a bunch of files. So we'll say style 2, style 3. In many cases, you'll have more than one style sheet <clears throat> Sorry, that's that's to be used in a document. You can even include uh, JavaScript or scripts in general, but I mean the most common script that's used in web pages is uh, JavaScript. Uh, so you do that by doing something like this. In fact, you can go on and using the script element, and then you can go on and start typing JavaScript in here. Or another way that you can do it if you know, if you have an external JavaScript file that you want to use in here, you can do that and say JavaScript or script, whatever, .js. That's the extension for JavaScript files as that is the extension for CSS files. So if there is a script .js file that is in the same folder as this particular document, you'll be able to access it by uh, through this. So that will go and download that script when this file or when this document is downloaded. And then the functionality that's in this script will then be used in this document. Coming back to links. So now we're going to have a little bit of fun. There's actually a link um, type that is called an icon. So an icon, you notice how in many websites, um, for instance, take Wikipedia. In many websites, there is this icon that is over here, right? This icon, similar to the way that the title of the page you specify in the header, the icon over here is also specified in the head, not in the header, in the head element. The icon is also specified in the head element. You notice over here, we actually do not have an icon element. So what we're going to do is we're going to quickly create one and then reference it. So for now, I'm going to, by the way, when you want to comment out, there's this concept that's called commenting out code. It's when you're saying that, okay, there's this information that I just want to leave over here, uh, maybe as a comment, or I just want to, I want it to not be read by the browser. So in HTML, and by the way, commenting is a, is a concept that you will find in almost every programming language. Uh, yeah, it's very good to comment your code so that you can be able to have information that will later on remind you, why did I write this particular thing? Anyway, so this thing is as good as gone. So this is how you comment, you open that bracket, exclamation mark, dash, dash, put in everything that you don't want the browser to actually interpret. And then you come, dash, dash, you close it. So now this is not read. We'll uncomment it in a moment. So we want to include our own icon. To do this, there are two applications that you'll need to download. One is called Inkscape. So I'll come over here and I'll say Inkscape. That's the one you can go on and download and install it. The other one is called GIMP. Same here, you can come over here, click on that and download it when you have them you can then be able to create your favicon. That's what they're called, favicon icon uh, files. So let's do that quickly. I'm going to come over to Inkscape. Okay, 
So Inkscape is basically a program that allows you to, similar to paint, but a bit more advanced. There's a lot of things you can do. You can create uh, SVG files. We'll get into that at a later stage. Yes, it's, it's worth me noting at this point in time that you see, when you want to be a web developer, it's very, you, you, you're going to have to get used to dealing with a lot of graphics. Uh, creating images here and there, more especially in terms of logos and favicons, etc. Well, you can always outsource work like that, but it's always good for you to learn that because sometimes you don't really need to get a graphics designer to do things for you. Uh, when it comes to some graphics, you can do them uh, for yourself, as we are about to do right now. Okay. So a favicon is, which is the name of that icon that appears there on the tab, is actually a 16 by 16 pixel image. So let's start by changing the pixelation over here. As you can see, it's quite small. And then change, remove that shadow. We don't want that. So we'll close this. We'll zoom in a little bit. And then we will write that. That's what our favicon will be for code with Zooks. That the Z in code with Zooks or Z if you're an American. Uh, okay. Then after that, we want to. Whoa! Oops. A. We want to then, can we name this in pixels? Lock that so that the aspect ratio will remain. We don't want it squashed. A. A, can we move? Okay. I think this program acts weirdly when I'm recording and at the same time uh, trying to work with it. It's actually a bug that I just picked up just now. It's fine, we'll do this. We'll use align distribute. That will allow me to relative to page. Okay, look, I'll be just right back. This thing is acting up very, very weirdly. I'm just going to take this thing and place it over here. Be back in a moment. I'm back, managed to put that thing over here. I don't know what that weirdness was. Anyways, so uh, moreover, I want my background to be black. So I'm going to come over here and change the background to black. And then I'm going to say I want to export this. Oh, wow. This thing is giving me a problem even with the exporting option. It's quite weird. Okay, let's do this. File, save as. I was wondering if there's a way for me to get this URL. Okay, look. Rather, what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this thing as a PNG file. Normally, you would be able to click on export. Oh, there we go. Ugh. So I'm going to save it over here. This is the same place where you can't see it because this is only showing PNG files. This is the same place where our uh, HTML document currently is. So we're going to save it over there as we will call it favicon. Then we say export, which is giving me... Okay, let's see if it was saved. Okay, there it is. It's been saved. It's a small file over there. That's supposed to go smoother. It's just that it seems like while I'm recording and using Inkscape, there seems to be a clash between the application I'm using to record to, to record and, and Inkscape. Anyways, so now that we've saved the image over here, we are then going to open it using the other program called, where is my open with? GIMP. Once you've installed GIMP, it should appear uh, under open with whenever you try to open an image file. So let's quickly go over there. We are going to use GIMP to convert 
this PNG file into an .ico file because that's the type of file that we want to use. All right, so it has opened. There's our file. So now we're just going to say export as. If we come over here and we look for. It's actually Microsoft Windows ICO. That's what it is. There we go. Favicon.ico. It's going to be saved in the same place. We'll say export. We don't want it compressed. That's fine. And then there it is. There's our favicon. So now I can close that. And I can also close Inscape. No. I don't want to save it. So we have our favicon. So now let's go back to our page. HTML document. We're going to uncomment this. And then we're going to say H reference favicon dot ico. Save that. Then let's open the file and look at that. There's our icon in the same way that Google has its own little icon over there. We also have our icon. In fact, even if I go to the original document, refresh, there it is. So we've seen now how you can actually use the head element to include a link not only to external uh, CSS files, but you can even specify in the same way that you can specify the title of the document, which appears over there in the tab. You can also uh, specify, I've shown you how we can create, quickly create a simple favicon. You can also specify that, okay, in this page, I want you to use this particular favicon, and then it appears over there. So back to meta tags a little bit, just to help us understand just how important meta tags can be. For instance, there is a meta tag which is called, rather which has the attribute called description. In the description, you would specify the description for this particular page. For instance, in this case, we would say uh, this document is an example of the typical structure of an HTML document. So now when your page is processed by a search engine such as Google, you know in a search engine when you say, um, I don't know, let's say HTML, you notice that there's this text that would appear over here. As we can see over here as well, over here. The text that you would see over here is actually specified in a tag that is similar to this tag, in this description tag. So you do not want a browser, or rather you don't want a search engine to have to go through your document and try to figure out, okay, what text is best for me to use as a snippet for this particular page. If you want to instruct search engines exactly what text to use when they are showing your particular page on the search results, you would come and use a tag like the description tag. So by now we should clearly see just how important this head element is. There are a lot of things that go in the head element that will not necessarily be visible on the browser when the when your particular page is being viewed. But even though that's the case, they are very important for your document. They contain the title that will appear on the tab. They specify the favicon icon that will appear also on your tag. They specify things like the external CSS styling files, which We'll see just how important those are in future lessons, uh, your JavaScript, etc. So it's very important for you to never ignore properly formatting your head tag. Now soon we're going to start 
on Tuesday specifically having what we're going to call micro hacks. In micro hacks, we're going to quickly use the skills that we have learned to create something that is, shall we say, a demo of how our skills can be used in a world or in, in a practical example. So in our first micro hack, which is going to be a few lessons from now, we're actually going to explore amongst other things using the head and see how, for instance, by properly putting in meta tags that are relevant, it'll influence how, for instance, Facebook and Twitter displays your content whenever a person references your web page. So just to quickly recap, the general structure of an HTML document includes the doc type, which specifies the type of document that this is, in this case, HTML, HTML5, which is the latest version of HTML. It includes the head, it includes, sorry, the HTML element, which, encom which encapsules or contains all the other elements. It includes the head and the body elements. In the head element, we include all bunch of information on the page itself. And then in the body element, that's where we actually put content that's going to be displayed by the browser when a user is visiting your web page. And that brings us to the end of our lesson. Next up, we'll learn about the DOM and how to use a browser to debug or to analyze your web page as you develop it. Later, you can watch other tutorials over here. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so that you don't miss out on tutorials as they come out. Have you subscribed? Are you done? Okay, cool.